Today on the podcast, we're going to start our monthly news and analysis episodes. In this episode, we'll look at changes mostly to the Florida resort over the past month. Also, we'll take a look at what might be announced at Destination D next week and the various economic and political pressures that Disney is likely working through as it considers what it will and what it won't announce for the parks. At this point, I've been through the Halloween displays and festivities in Florida. We'll talk about Florida today and tomorrow, which is Friday, September 1st. I'll check out the Halloween displays in California on the first day of Halloween season in California. In the middle of next week, then, we'll talk about Disneyland and DCA on an episode devoted to that resort. And then next Sunday, we'll focus more on company-wide issues. But even with an episode focused mainly on Florida, we still have a very chunky episode today with lots of things to explore. But before we jump into all the details, I'd like to thank another round of Bandcamp subscribers, as these are the people who keep this whole enterprise going. Gratitude is going out today to Jess Kuo. O2. Raku Sarah, Eric, 123 Mart, and Feet First. Thanks to each of you for supporting all we do here. And now let's kick in to the show. As I mentioned, we'll focus on the Florida resort today, and then in a couple of days, midweek, we'll do a similar episode focused on the California resort. To start with here, we'll explore some general updates for the Florida resort, and then we'll move on to all of the fall and Halloween festivities. At Epcot, Disney is slowly working toward the opening of Journey of Water. The construction walls are mostly down around the attraction, replaced by those familiar box hedges that rise up out of portable wooden planting boxes. But the area is finished. Journey of Water is similar to the type of exhibit one might find at a natural history museum with interactive displays. It demonstrates the water cycle with various play areas. It starts with a display centered on rain, then follows the water exhibit by exhibit exhibit as it collects into streams, then moves through the wetlands and springs before finally building into streams and lakes, and then lastly returning to the ocean. The walkway area is filled with lovely tropical plants and stunning rock work, some of which holds the images of characters from Moana the movie. Cast member previews are happening right now and will continue through September 22nd. On September 9th, previews will begin for Club 33 members, and beyond this, Disney is likely to announce previews for DVC members and annual pass holders. It's possible that Disney might also want to put together a D23 hard ticket preview event, such as they did for the Tron coaster. For Tron, Disney put together a $50 ticketed preview roughly three weeks before the general opening of Tron. Before that, Disney also put together a $35 ticketed preview for Cosmic Rewind. Journey of Water is a walkthrough experience. It will have a dedicated entrance and exit, so it will likely be classified as an attraction, like the Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse, and it won't be classified as a display or exhibit like those leaping fountains over at the Imagination Pavilion. True, Journey of Water is not an e-ticket, but similar to the opening of Tron, in recent years, Disney has worked to maximize profit and publicity from its attraction openings. So even with the Journey of Water, it's possible that we might see a ticketed preview for D23 members sometime late in September or early in October. Such an event would probably also be very welcomed by the D23 fan community, as these events always sell out. But this begs the question, 
when will the area open to the general public? I'm guessing that the date will be announced at Destination D next week. Destination D runs September 8th through the 10th in Florida. On stage will be many Disney executives, including President of Disney Parks, Josh DeMauro, who will likely discuss this attraction. But in terms of my best guess right now, I look at the possible opening date like this. Journey of Water may be a very pleasant experience, especially for children, but it's not a destination attraction. That is, it's not an attraction around which a typical family would build a vacation. So this is not an attraction that's going to deeply move the visitation needle. But Disney almost surely wants to get as much publicity and press from the opening as possible, likely also an increase in local visitation. At one point, September 22nd, the official kickoff for the Disney 100 celebration at the Florida Resort looked like a possible opening date, as did October 1st, which is both the anniversary of the opening of Walt Disney World and the anniversary of the opening of Epcot. But if it were either of these dates, I think we would have heard by now. Plus, there's another problem. October can be a busy month in Florida, especially as we approach Halloween. Halloween all by itself will increase attendance, especially in the last two weeks of October. And during this time, the resort can focus publicity on Halloween-related stories and photos. This leaves November, typically a low visitation month with the Food and Wine Festival winding down, when Disney might debut the Journey of Water so that the Disney PR team can focus on landing stories related to the attraction in as many papers and websites as possible. Even though Journey of Water might not increase overall visitation by itself, a steady stream of articles about the resort keeps a segment of the public thinking about their next trip to Disney. Again, this is just a guess, but I think by next week, that is the second week of September at Destination D, we'll likely have an opening date. At the other end of Epcot, work continues on barges for a new nighttime fireworks spectacular. There are now four barges docked at the backstage marina, which is just to the left of the American Adventure. Crews have been building these barges in pairs. The first two barges took a few weeks to assemble, as did the second two. It appears that there will be two more built as well, likely finished mid-September. The barges are far lower and smaller than those used for Harmonious. I believe that they are small enough to be moved in and out of the marina each day, just like the show barges used to do for Illuminations. The barges do have a little height on their backs, so the park may need to raise that drawbridge that sits between China and the South Africa outpost to move them from the marina to the lagoon, but this seems extremely manageable. For illuminations for years and years, the park used to raise that drawbridge to move the show barges out onto the lagoon each afternoon. These newly assembled barges appear to have launch platforms and fountain jets likely to create water screens for projections. Each of these new barges appears to have fairly large pipe structures, most likely designed to take in water from the lagoon and then feed it into some sort of jet to create those screens and fountains. And out in the center of World Showcase Lagoon, a second crew is placing pilings deep down into the lagoon bed to support a six-sided platform, likely for launch systems, lasers, and perhaps more fountains. Out in California, the World of Color fountain system is arranged inside of a man-made lake with a cement floor, which means that the various water jets, lights, and flamethrowers can be mounted to a grid that is then anchored to the cement shell. But World Showcase Lagoon is an actual lagoon with a dirt bottom. So pilings are used to create a surface platform and also locations to anchor those show barges, which will carry the fountain systems and launch systems for the fireworks. I'm guessing that the six barges will eventually link up with the six-sided platform a few hours before showtime, with the barges checked and restocked each day back in the marina. 
I think this system will be far easier to operate than the one for Harmonious. All fireworks systems need to be checked before and after each show. With any unused shells being placed into a special storage area that is designed for explosives. Setting the shells into launch tubes will probably be far easier to do by bringing those barges backstage rather than sending a crew out into the middle of the lagoon many times each day, as was the procedure for Harmonious. There are also some open areas on those barges that at least right now don't seem to be fully used. And so I'm wondering if Epcot is building barges that can easily be repurposed for other shows in the future, or maybe there's simply more systems that will be later integrated into these platforms for the coming show. At this point, it seems nearly impossible that the new show initially arranged for the Disney 100 celebration will be ready for the Disney 100 premiere at Epcot. The Lagoon platform is not done. On my last visit, some pylons were still rising many stories above the waterline, maybe 50 feet or so, and the show barges aren't finished as well. The equipment needs to be finished, and then crews need to test the show. One of the variables here will be the type of equipment they test. If this is all familiar launch and fountain equipment, the testing might go quickly. But if some of it is experimental, as was the case for Illuminations and Harmonious, there might be a longer time for adjustments. Even with stock equipment, I think we're still months away from opening. I'm sure that the resort would like to use this new show to draw holiday crowds to Epcot where there's a lot more capacity and to move them away from Magic Kingdom and Hollywood Studios, but the construction timeline as it's playing out suggests that this may now be unlikely. There's still a lot of work to do here. But as with that opening date for the Journey of Water, I'm guessing we'll find out more about this at Destination D next week. And before we move on from attractions currently under construction, let's talk for a minute about Tiana's Bayou Adventure at the Magic Kingdom. Tiana's Bayou Adventure is significantly further along than work on the same attraction in California. The big question now is this. Can Disney get that rethemed attraction open for the 2024 holiday season? I think it's still a stretch. But a visual comparison between the two attractions, the one in Florida and the one in California, reveals stark contrasts and how much quicker the process is moving along at the Magic Kingdom. And then there's Animal Kingdom and the question of how to expand the Florida Resort in the coming years. A couple of weeks back, on October 18th, a half dozen senior Imagineering managers toured sections of Animal Kingdom, specifically the Dinoland area, which presently is in poor repair. Gone is the old spinning primeval world coaster, and about every other time I step into Animal Kingdom, I get a pop-up message on MDE to alert me that cast members are doing their best to bring the dinosaur attraction back online. The current Dinoland area is the space that a year back was teased as the possible location for a new Moana area and a new Zootopia area. If I was reading the concept art correctly back then, the Moana area and ride would be an entirely new development, while Zootopia might be arranged around the existing dinosaur attraction, with that attraction and ride system simply being dressed with new stage scenes key to Zootopia. In that group of managers that recently toured Animal Kingdom was Imagineer Chris Beatty, who was a creative director for Galaxy's Edge and for New Fantasyland. That is, he's a person familiar with large projects filled with multiple attractions. Their visit to Animal Kingdom suggests that plans might slowly be moving forward on a Moana and or Zootopia area. 
From the minimal artwork that was released last year, it was clear that the Moana area had received more thought and detail, including a ride system for the ride and placement of a show building. And so maybe, and just maybe, if design work is now moving forward on one or both of these projects, we might hear something about this next week at Destination D. But Florida announcements right now are fraught with political and financial strategies. So let me look at both sides of this issue, because I believe there are two conflicting areas of motivation that are guiding the company forward here in fits and starts. There is reason to believe that we're finally going to receive some park announcements, but there's also reason to think that maybe these won't be major announcements, at least for Florida. In July, when D23 first released the Destination D schedule, it listed Disney Park President Josh DeMauro's presentation as one that would define uh, the elements that make a Disney experience truly magical and memorable. This initial description didn't suggest anything concerning park announcements, but then... This description was revised late in August. DeMar's presentation was then described as one that would look at uh, the future of the Disney parks featuring updates from around the world and some fun surprises along the way. This was a curious change, and this says to me that we're likely going to get some announcements about the future of the parks even if those announcements don't turn into actual areas or attractions for another four to five years. Disney clearly understands what it's suggesting here when it changes a presentation description in this way. This creates a set of expectations for the audience. And so, if this were really any other year, I would believe that Josh DeMauro would almost surely make at least one significant announcement concerning a major attraction or themed area for Florida, but this is not simply any other year. At the moment, Disney is also in a battle with the state of Florida over control of the Reedy Creek Improvement District. In this, Disney's position, at least in part, has been to withhold or remove support that would financially benefit Florida as a way to demonstrate how, under more favorable political conditions, the company might benefit Florida. This is a type of financial leverage to exert pressure on the governor. Just think back to Disney's cancellation of the Lake Nona project, along with the 2,000 high-paying professional jobs that would have been brought to Florida. So this ongoing posture creates a motivation for Disney not to make significant announcements, at least in terms of the Florida resort, as a way of demonstrating that they are limiting investment at Disney World until political problems are resolved with Reedy Creek. And if this remains a motivating factor, Disney may choose to announce very little, particularly in terms of expensive attractions for Florida. This may mean that announcements for Florida are focused more on restaurants or shopping areas, maybe some more information about those improvements to DVC over at Fort Wilderness, maybe a themed restaurant. I'm guessing the Magic Kingdom will likely get a restaurant theme to the Princess and the Frog to go along with that re-theme of Splash Mountain. So maybe that's a low-stakes, low-cost announcement. Also, entertainment is less expensive than an attraction, such as a new parade, particularly a nighttime parade for the Magic Kingdom, or perhaps something finally to keep guests in Animal Kingdom into the evening. In terms of lower investments in attractions, a re-theme of the dinosaur ride to a new property like Zootopia is a lower cost investment than an attraction that is built from the ground up. So that might be a possibility as well. But a year ago, in that artwork, the attraction with the greatest detail was the Moana boat ride. And if this were any other year again, 
I'd place a bet on an announcement of a Moana attraction at Animal Kingdom, but I also realized that presently such a large announcement for Florida might constrain the company's ongoing political strategy as it concerns Florida. Essentially, why would Florida negotiate with Disney over Reedy Creek if Disney is still pumping money into the resort to increase the tourism dollars that flow into the state? But that's only one factor here. In addition to the political dispute with the state, Disney also needs to raise its stock price. The Disney stock presently is the lowest that it's been in nine years. It's been floating in the mid 80s and low 90s for months now, but recently has started to test the low 80s and could easily slip into the 70s in the next month. The three big problems for stock valuation are Disney Plus running at a significant loss, declining value of its linear TV assets, and poor performance of recent films at the box office. But beyond these, in a much lower position is this. Visitation to Disney World is significantly down, and the resort has soft reservations through 2024. Some Disney hotels even have closed wings due to lower occupancy. I've also been told that other hotels are, at times, hovering around 60% occupancy, which is very low for a Disney property. Meaningful announcements about new attractions will likely create a situation where investors know that when these attractions open, there should be an uptick in tourism and revenue, which might help elevate the stock price or at least give investors a timeline as to how the company is moving toward improved visitation levels at its flagship resort in the years ahead. Again, the American resorts are not a central investor concern at the moment. On that last earnings call, no analysts discussed them at all. But announcements that show new attractions, which will spike visitation, would likely place at least a little upwards pressure on the stock price and also chart out a path to a more traditional, that is, post-Chapek manner, in which new additions to the Florida resort are continually moving through design and construction schedules. So if I had to take a guess, I would say that the problems of low visitation in Florida, combined with a low stock price overall, might push Bob Iker and Josh Demaro into making a slightly larger announcement in Florida than they had initially planned, as the loss of revenue from future visitation looks like a more significant issue at this point than defining an aggressive posture for the problems with the state government in Florida. Also, tomorrow's presentation could simply sidestep this entire issue by focusing on announcements for international parks and for the California resort. On some hard drive over in Glendale, I'm sure, are very rough plans for that King Thanos attraction once discussed for DCA. Also, there's likely some very loose ideas for that Avatar attraction that was earmarked for the California resort. And then if the focus of the presentation is the international parks in California, at the end of it, DeMauro might simply say something like, and we believe that there are big projects also headed to Florida soon, but more on that later. This would give the room the feel of an announcement without undercutting Disney's bargaining power with the state government. But we're going to have to wait until next week to see what actually pans out in terms of announcements. And I do suspect that Disney execs right now are looking at these exact concerns in terms of putting together that presentation. Sometimes these D23 presentations aren't fully hammered out until the day of the presentation. I know this has been true at least for the expo in past years. One last thing before we start talking about Halloween at the Florida Resort, it's this. Disney has recently redesigned its restaurant reservation system for both Disneyland and Disney World. 
The redesigned system affects both the apps and the web pages. And this is mostly good news, particularly for people using the app. In Florida, a lot of the complaints about the My Disney Experience app are focused on its speed and reliability. But I think there's an invisible issue here that is significant, and that concerns how people tend to use various apps while walking through a park. To look at this, let's create some basic categories for screen use. At home, there are two main environments where people use screens, in the den and in the living room. The living room is largely about passive or semi-passive entertainment. In the living room, people lean back and relax while watching a TV show or movie or playing a video game on a screen. In the den or office, however, people sit in a firm chair and lean forward as they focus on various projects that need to be completed. The living room is great for watching The Mandalorian, and the den is fabulous for writing a paper or paying bills or answering long emails or maybe writing a script for, who knows, your next podcast episode. When people are out on the town walking around, they use screens in yet another way typically for quick interactions. Maybe they reply to a short text, or they use their phone to stream music, or they get directions from a map program. But most of these walking around activities are low interaction, low focus uses for a screen. And this brings us up to planning a day at Disneyland or Disney World. Picking a restaurant for lunch involves moving through multiple screens, selecting number in party, date, time, etc., and then looking at many, often dozens of possibilities, and then clicking on menu offerings, pricing, and location. This process is a little more involved in Florida due to the number of restaurants there than it is in California. For me, the most convenient space to work through future restaurant reservations is in the den, leaning in, elbows on the table, focused on the computer. But for many people, picking a restaurant is often something they do while in the park. Only the experience of picking a restaurant, even on the app, still involves working through many screens and often scrolling through a long list of possible restaurants. This is not the type of work that most people would choose to do while walking and using only their phones. That is, use and function don't match well here with My Disney Experience or the Disneyland app. The new update for restaurant reservations, which is the same for Disneyland and Disney World, addresses some of these problems. The new updates allow you to see open reservations for an entire day, not just for lunch or dinner. Let's say you wanted to dine at Akershus at Epcot, and you really didn't care if it was breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You simply wanted the experience of that dining space. Previously, you'd need to look up breakfast time slot at Akershus, then lunch, then dinner. Also, the app previously gave you up to three dining times and no more than that. Now you can see all dining times at once if you choose from morning through night, along with every available time option that suits your party size. So this is an improvement. You can also filter these results to just show one meal time, for example, just dinner time, but you can also look at the entire day's reservation on one screen and beyond this, you can narrow down the restaurants by dining location. So you can filter results to show only those restaurants at Epcot or the Magic Kingdom or Disney Springs. If you're in California, California, you can filter by Disneyland, DCA, Disneyland Hotel, and so on. You can also filter restaurants by price range and cuisine. Making reservations on the app still takes many screens, so the overall form and function problem isn't fully fixed with this upgrade, but it does improve the experience. It moves the process a little bit closer to the type of activity that most people would find comfortable and convenient to perform while walking around and using their phones. 
With this change, I suspect that Disney is fully aware that the in-park apps have become a time and focus burden for many people on vacation, and it appears that they are trying to improve in both of these areas. I don't think this current update fixes the overall problem. Making a reservation still feels more like an activity that is more convenient on my laptop than it is on my phone, but it does move the Disney apps in the right direction. And in Florida, starting in January 2024, you will also be able to filter restaurant results to show only those venues that accept the dining plan, which comes back online starting January 9th. And those are all the news items I have for Florida, and this moves us up into the season of Halloween. I'm not sure that there's any place on Earth where Halloween is celebrated as a seasonal holiday for as many days as it's celebrated at Disney World. Halloween season presently runs from August 11th through November 1st, which is 82 days. Far longer than the celebration lasts at the California Resort, 82 days is almost 25% of the entire year. To put it simply, for nearly a quarter of the year, there are pumpkins up and down Main Street. Compared to the winter holidays, there's a Christmas tree on Main Street at the Magic Kingdom for about 60 days, and over at Epcot, the winter holidays are only up for 45 days. Despite the length of this holiday season, in Florida, it's really only celebrated at a few locations, primarily on Main Street, with those inventive pumpkin figures, along with events for the not-so-scary party. But outside of the Magic Kingdom, there's little for Halloween. Over at Hollywood Studios, Hollywood and Vine is transformed into a Halloween-themed character meal during lunch and dinner, and this part is important. It's only for lunch and dinner. Breakfast remains themed to Disney Junior, which is a shame, as the chicken and waffles dressed with a spicy honey sauce are one of the best things that this restaurant serves any time of day. But if you get the waffles, then you're having your photo taken with Doc McStuffins, not Vampire Mickey. And if you're an adult, your Vampire Mickey selfie plays a lot better on your Facebook feed than your snap with the Doc. Anyway, between 10.30 and 11.30, the wait staff at Hollywood and Vine replaces the Disney Junior your banners and photo backdrop with Halloween banners and a Halloween backdrop themed to the holiday. The Disney Junior characters are also swapped out with Mickey, Minnie, Goofy, and Pluto, all wearing their Halloween costumes. Your family will have plenty of time to spend with the characters, but in my view, the cost of this meal probably exceeds its value. The two best character meals, both in terms of food quality and environment, remain Topolino's for breakfast, and for dinner, Storybook Dining at Artist Point. If you were looking to select a character meal, I'd easily select those two over Hollywood and Vine, even with that Halloween decor. And after Hollywood and Vine and the Magic Kingdom, there's very little Halloween decor in any of the parks. But this wasn't always the case. Back in the 1990s, Hollywood Studios had the Goosebumps Horrorland Fright Show and Walkthrough Funhouse during the month of October. Also, over at the Fort Wilderness Barn, the resort used to hold a Return to Sleepy Hollow event featuring the Headless Horseman and a screening of the Disney film The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. But this has been on hiatus since 2018. Beyond this, usually there's some small displays over at Disney Springs, but when I walked through the springs this last week, I saw only one big Halloween retail display in the World of Disney shop. And the lower levels of Halloween decorations are very much in contrast to what is developed each year out at the California Resort. And we'll talk about that and the reasons behind that later this week when we explore the changes to the California Resort. The Florida Resort didn't really get into the business of celebrating Halloween until its second year, 1972. During its first year, crews were simply too busy finishing the park and managing the opening ceremonies, which took place at the end of October 1971. But that second year, Disney jumped lightly into Halloween. 
The first Halloween celebration at Disney World lasted just two days, October 28th and 29th, which was the weekend before the actual holiday. There was a parade of villains down Main Street, photo ops with the Wicked Witch from Snow White at the castle, and free admission to the Haunted Mansion. This was back during a period when each attraction had its own ticket, so during Halloween weekend, guests could freely enter the mansion without giving up a precious e-ticket. Lastly, young guests got either a Mickey Mouse mask or a poster in their choice. And from those early beginnings, the Halloween celebrations slowly expanded. Four years later, the weekend event included internationally renowned magician Harry Blackstone performing multiple shows on the space stage. Also, over at the Diamond Horseshoe Review, the park showed the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Then, in 1979, the park hosted its very first hard-ticket Halloween event. It was just a single night, Saturday, October 27th, from 9 p.m. until 1.30 in the morning, and was directed at adults. Tickets were $8.95, which included unlimited rides on all Magic Kingdom attractions, but the centerpiece of this event was the music. Performers included Dr. Hook, who back in the late 1970s was a hugely popular act, and up-and-comers such as The Police, who had just had a breakout hit with Roxanne. And then starting in 1981, the Halloween festivities were shifted over to the Lake Buena Vista Shopping Village, the area that's now known as Disney Springs, where the festivities again focused on kids. There was a Phantom of the Village Ghost Review, a Halloween parade, and a costume contest. On the outdoor stage, which was once down by the docks, the shopping village showed the legend of Sleepy Hollow free of charge. By 1983, some of the village restaurants were getting in on the act, with spiced cider, candied apples, and pumpkin cookies. Over Halloween weekend, guests could find various characters at the village, from the Evil Queen to Maleficent, making the shopping village feel more like a theme park. Also in the mix were Halloween characters, such as Dr. Jekyll, who were plucked from classic Universal monster films. And there was a lot of them. In all, there were nearly 30 villains arranged into 13 unlucky locations for guests to meet in areas between the shops. In 1987, probably because Halloween was on a Saturday, the village also offered trick-or-treating for the first time. And by this point, many elements of a traditional Disney celebration were at the shopping village. Guests in costumes, a Halloween parade, a selection of villains not usually seen in the park, special Halloween treats, and trick-or-treating at multiple locations. And that right there sounds like a reasonable description of Mickey's Not So Scary. But Mickey's Not So Scary didn't premiere for many more years. It took a while for Halloween to move from the shopping district back to the Magic Kingdom. It only happened in 1995, as Disney expanded the shopping area, combining up the shopping village with Pleasure Island to make the new downtown Disney district. In short, the old shopping village was simply now too busy and more focused on adult events to support family-friendly celebrations for kids. In 1995, the very first Mickey's Not So Scary was a one-night event, only on Halloween. And it was scheduled as counter-programming to Universal's Halloween Horror Nights, then in its fourth year. Universal, the first of the hard-ticket Halloween events in Florida, was for teens and adults, while Mickey's Not So Scary was for families with younger children. And from there, it slowly developed into a hard-ticket event that now starts in mid-August and typically ends on November 1st. And so, what's new and what's working well in this year's not-so-scary event? First of all, I don't have firm numbers on attendance, but I will say that the crowds, at least in mid-August, felt a little lighter than last year and significantly lighter than pre-pandemic levels. In terms of the feel of the park, crowd levels felt the heaviest in 2018 and 2019. Two weeks ago, I was there on a sold-out night 
which suggested that the event reached its projected attendance level with everyone moving through a haze of late summer humidity in search of shows and candy. There were only three times that the park felt a little crowded. In the hub during the fireworks at 10.15, at the mansion almost any time during the night. It's the Halloween party, and so even in August, the mansion is swamped. And to a lesser extent, during the first parade, but even then, 20 minutes before the parade, you could find a spot on the curb with no one in front of you. Compared to pre-pandemic Halloween parties, this event felt noticeably lighter, with many rides being near walk-ons with wait times at others 10 minutes or less. Some paths, particularly near the back of the park, were mostly empty for most of the night. I should point out that I was there during the first week of the event. It's possible that Disney will scale up attendance as we move toward October, but at least this past month, attendance, even at a sold-out event, was minimal. So light that I believe that the park has, post-pandemic, recalibrated party caps to a more manageable and certainly more pleasant level. During the day for regular park guests, Halloween festivities are limited to Main Street, but for the after-hours party, the park is unified through sound, lighting, and entertainment so that all of the lands are transformed into a Halloween celebration. If you regularly visit the parks, I think that this is the best reason to attend. It takes a familiar place, the Magic Kingdom, and uses lighting, entertainment, and music to transform its identity into something new. Most of this works very well. I might quibble a little with the inclusion of ACDC on the evening's background loop in Adventureland, but at least now I've heard ACDC in the Magic Kingdom. Beyond the entertainment, though, there are very nice touches. Universal has been using scare zones at Halloween Horror Nights for many years now. These are areas where costumed characters, usually as a group, stalk guests through areas called the Jungle of Doom or the Summer of Blood. This year, Disney has a version of a scare zone. The back section of Adventureland is overrun with pirates, only they are lined up to entertain rather than scare. Roving pirates will approach you to discuss your sailing adventures, and every 30 minutes, a pirate band takes the stage to play music. And over in Frontierland, up on the balcony above the country bears, the cadaver dance once again, in their ghoulish makeup, or singing Halloween favorites in their four-part harmony. And at the mansion, Madame Carlotta is back, arranged in her ghostly blue dress and umbrella to tell visitors stories as they line up for the ride. And this type of entertainment is really the center of the event, more intimate experiences arranged for the evening party which make familiar locations feel new. Beyond those entertainment zones, the parade has been lightly refreshed this year. The most notable change is that the first float now features Mickey, Daisy, and Clarabelle dressed as the Sanderson sisters from Hocus Pocus, but there are other small changes as well. From 101 Dalmatians, Horace and Jasper now show for Cruella down the road. Cruella is not a deep cut, but Horace and Jasper certainly are. And the parade also features longtime favorites such as the gravediggers dragging their shovels, sparks and all down Main Street. And if you get there for the parade a little early, you'll see Goofy's son Max dressed up as his musical hero, Powerline, singing Eye to Eye complete with the fishing rod and reel dance moves from the movie and if none of what i just said makes sense to you just know that powerline is an animated character mixed up with one part prince and two parts michael jackson who is a major player in the goofy movie which despite being a low budget production from the mid 1990s is surprisingly good primarily due to its script and voice work over on the castle stage the Hocus Pocus Villain Spectacular, which features the real Sanderson sisters, or at least very accomplished actresses playing them, now has new pyro for the finale, and this is definitely an upgrade to last year's show. And lastly, the fireworks show with its projections remains the same as last year, but unlike at Disneyland in California, 
the Halloween party in Florida is the only place where you can see the Halloween fireworks. If you've been to the Magic Kingdom a dozen or five dozen times, this event is a way to change up the familiar experience of being in the park with many new elements. That, I think, is one of the main reasons to go. People always ask, is it worth the price of admission? And my answer is probably. The cost is about the same as a day ticket to the park. On the downside, you do have less time in the park than you do during the day, but on the upside, the park is far less crowded than on a typical day, even a typical day right now during the lull of 2023. Another thing to consider, most of the major rides are open from the Mansion to Space Mountain to Tron, which you should know is a virtual queue that opens to party guests right at 6 p.m. So far, the Tron virtual queue has filled up very quickly within just a few seconds. So if you want to do Tron, make sure you are ready on the MDE app right at six. But a handful of attractions, mostly shows such as Carousel of Progress and Country Bears are closed during the event. If you do go, you will likely spend much of your time with the special events from the parade to the fireworks to the various shows and experiences. So if you're mainly at the park for the rides, you would have more time to experience them with a typical day ticket. Lastly, two pieces of general advice. First, Mickey's Not So Scary causes the park to close early for regular day guests, which causes crowds to stay away from the Magic Kingdom on those days. If you're on a park hopper ticket, the Magic Kingdom is a great place to spend time on those days that Not So Scary takes over in the evenings, and then you can park hop to another park. And second, if you do go to the party, typically guests walk into the park and start trick-or-treating right away, which creates lines for this experience early in the evening of maybe 10 to 15 minutes each. It also means that you have a big sack of candy to carry around for the rest of the night. But if you wait until after the fireworks, you can breeze through nearly any trick-or-treat line you like, including those locations inside the Country Bears and the Tiki Room, and stock up on free candy shortly before heading home. And that, I think, brings us all up to date on everything that's happening and changing right now in Florida. I'll be back later this week to cover recent changes to the California Resort. So look for an extra episode in your feed this week. And then next Sunday, we'll have an update for the Disney Company, those areas outside of park experiences. There's simply a lot of moving parts right now inside of the Disney Company, so I'm trying to cover them in topical episodes that each explore many related stories. My goal here is to make sure that you feel connected to the parks, the films, and the company, and also to give you an understanding of the movements that will reshape the Disney company, not only for this year, but also for years to come. So hopefully each of you, at least in terms of the Florida resort now, feels plugged in. And in a few days, we'll explore other aspects of the company, starting with the resort in California. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney Studio and the parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney Company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions. On Bandcamp, you'll find over 200 episodes not available on iTunes or anywhere else. But the best reason to join our Bandcamp group is to support the work we do here and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can become a monthly subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. So, until later this week, this is Todd James Pierce.